sometimes publishers really missed the mark when it came to releasing games in different regions. Nowadays we take for granted that games will be given worldwide release, it's just a matter of what consoles they're on. Historically, console exclusivity was much more prevalent, largely because of Nintendo's questionable ethics and ruthless business models, but this led to vastly more varied libraries to go alongside the equally varied technologies. Today's top-end video game machines are basically indistinguishable from one another, to the point where it's like deciding between different brands of mineral water. They have identical capabilities and almost identical libraries. You might gather that I'm no lover of the modern video game scene, but one thing that it does have going for it is availability. It's pretty much a guarantee that a game will be released in your region. This was not the case in the 90s. Pop and Twinbee, or Twinbee Da as it was called in Japan, is a title that fell foul to this. Originally put out in Japan in 1990, and not released anywhere else until 1994, and then only in Europe, we have a vertically scrolling shoot 'em up by the creators of the glorious Gradius series. Konami has an excellent pedigree for shoot 'em ups, as we know. The game is not based on Parodius as I originally thought, rather, Parodius is kind of like a cross between a Twinbee game and a Gradius game. In fact, Twinbee is a series going back to the arcades of 1985 that didn't really show its face in North America. It turns out that in 1993, a title called Pop and Twinbee was released in Japan and Europe for the SNES slash Super Famicom. And so, to tie in with this, Konami decided to rename this little gem and release it on Game Boy in Europe. As a Konami shooter, up it's got a lot to live up to, but it does stand up on its own and is by no means a carbon copy of Gradius. You have a kind of life bar where your ship is flanked by a little circle on either side. If you get hit on the right side, you'll lose the little circle on that side, but not die. Get hit again on that side and you'll explode, but the left side can still take a hit. These don't help you if you come into contact with an enemy, you just die straight away, but this is a neat modification on the shield mechanism found in other games, and you get it from the start. The circles are also replenishable by collecting medikits. I find this really helpful because there is a surprisingly high level of projectiles on screen at times more than you'd imagine the Game Boy could handle. What's really impressive is that there is virtually no sprite flicker at all, and no discernible slowdown. Konami used the alternate frame overlay technique to effectively double the number of visible sprites. Your shields and bullets all flicker like this, but seeing as how the Game Boy runs at 60 FPS, it appears as being partially translucent, but definitely visible. What this did was give the programmers license to throw all manner of stuff at you, meaning those couple of hits you can take are invaluable. Having said that, the game doesn't cheat you that much. Occasionally you'll get blindsided by a swarm of enemies coming from one side of the screen, but as long as you don't hug the edges too much, you should be fine. If you've ever played Parodius, you'll be familiar with the giant bells that fly towards you sometimes. Juggling them with your bullets causes them to change colour, giving different bonuses. Well, this is where they come from. Here, you'll often be presented with clouds, bubbles, or some such thing that, if you shoot them, a bell comes out and hurtles towards you. You can shoot at them, and they rebound away. They give more points the more you collect without missing one, up to 10,000 points a time, and they're worth getting because you get an extra life every 100,000 points. What's really handy with these, though, is the occasional power-ups they drop. The idea is that you shoot the bells until they change colour, at least that's what you do in colourised versions such as the one found on Konami GB Collection Volume 3. It's harder to see on the original Game Boy version, but you can just about make out a different shading. The upgrades are necessary too, as the basic weapon is pretty weak and there are no missiles or laser upgrades. You first get a double shot, and then a triple. There is a kind of option pickup whereby two ghosts of your craft mimic your movements and shots. Another cool pickup is this basketball thing that flies around the screen, smashing everything it hits. Many enemies are stationary on the ground. Turrets, skulls, hands, and all manner of weird things in that cute em up style that Konami did so well. And you can hit these by dropping bombs with the A button. You don't have to be too accurate, simply being close enough is enough for the game to auto-target them, and they always drop points, and occasionally a star that wipes out the whole screen. These seem to come about at the most frantic times, so even if you're swamped in a dogfight, try to hit those ground targets too. 
Like I say, aiming is not paramount, so it's certainly worth it. The graphics are cute and funny, which you would expect, and the amount of stuff they manage to put on screen is astounding. If you're overwhelmed, it's because there's so much going on, not because the system couldn't handle it. The music is as memorable as some of Konami's other timeless shoot 'em ups We came to expect some stunning soundtracks from Konami, and this Audible offering is right up there. The boss music is a stark contrast to the cheerfulness of the levels, and oh man, that explosion sound. The bosses themselves are not that hard, but they look great. Just before the final boss, you have a boss rush of five different mini-bosses, who happen to be bosses from older Twinbee arcade games, whose attack patterns are quite varied. Individually, these are not so tough. They don't have as much health as the main game bosses, but even so, tackling five in a row is no mean feat. Then you go through a door labelled with the kanji for Origin, and you're onto the main boss, who has its own level and some funny dialogue beforehand. I dare you to fell Cyber Popo. I don't know. So, although the European release was a bit of a cash in on the SNES version, Pop and Twinbee for the Game Boy is an excellent title that we can be grateful to have. It's such a shame it took so long to be released anywhere outside Japan, even more so that North America missed out altogether.